So I'm going to show you an example of a dry crevice garden. As I mentioned before, these crevice gardens can be really great for dry climates as long as you build them right with nice deep soil and choose plants with nice deep tap roots. So here we go. This is my dry crevice garden. This is uh, these feature plants from dry areas. My front garden is also unwatered and a lot of it's kind of desert meadow. And I'm kind of fascinated with the interplay of meadow and rock garden because they do kind of fight each other. I mean, you see like Mirabilis sewing into the cracks and I ask them stuff like, what's gonna happen? Is this gonna dry out and kill them or are they gonna like it and eat the garden? You said, by the way, Paul, that alongside show and tell outside, you might have snuck in a couple of plants. Um, I did, yeah, yeah. You want me to share oh, my screen? We always want as many plants as humanly possible in these podcasts. So if you've got some okay. extras. This is the little blurb I was going to show you guys about, uh, which has lots of goofy pictures of Kent and I that, you know, look like this, like from the <laughs> bank, right? when we first met. Serious um, person. You're ruining my persona, Paul. Yeah. There's the uh, there's the other end of that was that was Us this drinking year, so beer, boy. That's a rare event. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that never well, happened. That is uh, that is um, that is uh, twelve years between those two pictures. Uh, anyway, oh, wow. um, I was going to show you. I was going to show you this plant. So areogonums. Uh, Kenton mentioned areogonums. They're dry land plants um, from predominantly Western North America. Three hundred and fifty some species. So yes, lots and lots, and lots some get tall. Some, some stay short, um, and I have lots of favorites, but this one is my all-time favorite, partly because it grows nearby to here. It's native to the very west of North America, Areogonum ovalifolium. Um, if these are alpine buckwheats. Uh, this is another 12-month plant. When it's not blooming, it's evergreen or ever gray, because you could say right through the whole winter, and um, just an absolutely gorgeous thing. Uh, and then I guess a bit of a repeat, repeat, but it's at least blooming now. Um, this is uh, what I showed you. In fact, it's the same plants that I just went outside and showed mm. you. Acanthalimum trojanum uh, from, uh, from the rock garden, but this time in full bloom. So you can see how choice this plant is, especially when planted in multiples. Um, you get that really natural effect with the flowers right on the foliage. So, I cannot uh, tell you how extreme my FLOMO is right now. <laughs> 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 Uh, and so this is again another. There's great only one cure. <laughs> There's only one cure. That's true. So that's just a couple plants I threw on there. But I, I don't know, Kenton, if you want to make a mention of, of these babies. Oh yeah, this, these are my flum actually because these things bloom like the whole month of April. But if I miss the first ones or some of the coolest ones blooming in the garden, I'm real sad. And they open in the afternoon too, so if I have to work in the afternoon, I'm real bummed out. But. The Alinopsis hybrids, we uh, were riding these hard. They're so fun. Um, speaking of promiscuous, like Alinopsis, that genus, and some of its related ones like Nenantis, Technopsis, Delanthi, they all cross with each other. They're all from South Africa. They obviously are relatives of the ice plant. Um, but it seems, Paul and I, uh, you know, in our travels, we found it seems that a crevice garden is what unlocks being able to grow them in winter wet climates. Because ironically, they're from actually a winter rainfall area in South Africa, but it's just not that much rain. Oh, but they're great. They need the sun to open, but when they do, you get this. And they come in almost any color but blue. And especially with them crossing with each other, you get ones with stripes or multicolors. Um, and they're super easy from seed. Like, they just come up. No pretreatment necessary. They, they've been grown as windowsill plants, actually, in Europe and the UK for a really long time. I think we should they, look at them. They look, the flowers look very similar to Delosperma. Again, it's South Africa. Plus, yep, all the same mesom, the mesom family, Isoacee. Yep. Mesembranthema. Yeah, that's a, yeah, it's that family. They're, uh, they're, they're juicy. I love those things. Just have a look at the, just look at the foliage of that, of that plant too, though. Isn't it just mm. incredible? Uh, it looks like a little rock itself. And in fact, I believe one of the common names for this is the hardy living stone. Mm -hmm. um, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, because uh, some of them mimic rocks to avoid getting eaten. Yeah, yeah, it looks like its own little crevice garden. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> nice. They nice. can have their own plants growing in there. <laughs> to be fair, like this, this is a taprooted thing. What I love about it is you can take cuttings. You could accidentally break the taproot when you plant it and it doesn't care. Um, and it, to be fair, it doesn't need a crevice garden, but it looks really good in a crevice garden. Well, it doesn't need one for me um, in the UK, actually, and on the west coast of the US, um, where it's wetter, it needs a crevice garden, actually. Um, yeah, it needs that drainage. That was our excuse to put so many pictures <laughs> up on the 
Well, so here's a uh, here's another one for you, Kenton. Just throwing you little curveballs mm. here. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. So the Echinosteria sista in my front yard, Western North American down to uh, down into Mexico. There's a lot of species in Mexico too, but they range in colors and they cross with each other, which makes them fun in the garden. Some have these huge flowers that are fragrant, yellows and purples. The reds are my favorite. That's what's local here when we go hiking. Um, actually, you know, you're, you're, the, the desert garden, Alan, where, where you're at, I'd be curious yeah. to see how much it approximates where I live. Like, that's where we were hiking yesterday, is in these arroyos that are dry most of the that time. We grow Opuntias and Trichocereus. Nice. Really nice. Well, perhaps in a dry enough place, or if you can squeeze a crevice garden into that garden, you could do some Echinocereus, maybe. And actually, um, our, our friend... Um, uh, Jeremy at uh, Plant Delights Nursery on the east coast of the U.S. They built a, probably the world's largest crevice garden out of broken concrete, and they're growing all these Mexican species of Echinocereus, and their climate is wet. In fact, it's humid in the summer, so I, I wonder if some of those Mexican species would do well in the U.K. if they were in a crevice could garden. Do, yeah. You know, I, I really think it's, I mean, and Cumbleton, you know, he grew these outside in the U.K. I, I think under, he put glass covers on them most of the time, but I got to point out, that like an alpine plant, most echinocereus are cushions, they're buns. Now, you wouldn't want to touch them and pet them uh, <laughs> like the, the arenarias or something. When you said they were scented, I thought, well, I wouldn't want to put my nose in there. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's when it's big and soft and purple and, 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 and like silk, you'll stuff your nose. Well, actually, you don't have to. You can smell it from a distance. They're that yeah. strong. So, yeah. But I love these guys. They're they're a bunch of fun. They're they're worth the wait. And uh, and they love to bloom when I'm gone. That's usually what they do in <laughs> April. They're like wait till there's a work trip and then they all go yeah. off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is what gardening is. Like your plants uh -huh. control you. Like they just wait until you're going and then they're like, here we are. <laughs> yeah, that happened a lot this spring. I, I, I keep looking at my garden, seeing these seed heads and thinking, I don't remember seeing the bloom on that this year. And then yeah, I thought, oh yeah, it was hardly home this year. <laughs> sure, <'cause> Paul <laughs> and I were on the book tour. That yeah, it happened to me a lot too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right in the middle of yeah. spring, right when the garden's in peak bloom, we have to leave it. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the irony, huh? <laughs> yeah. Did, was that was that it of your um your screen shared photos? That's all I threw on there. Yeah. Just uh just four drought, droughty plants for uh two different climates and um quite quite perfect crevice garden plants. And, and the first time we've screen shared on Talking Dirty, look at that. 95 mm. episodes. Wow. <laughs> first time for everything. Thank you for the the slideshow. It was um it was amazing and has given me serious mm. flomo. Um for anyone who's joining <laughs> us for the first time, flomo is how I live my life. It's this fear of missing out I get about flowers, plants, trees. Actually, I was um, visiting a garden in Cambridge earlier where I've just seen so many trees I want to grow and I have a tiny suburban garden. So it's, it's you know, it's, they're not all going to be happening for sure. But there is there is a lot of Lomo from your book. And I'm lucky because actually one of these I looked up and we have an alpine specialist who we featured on the podcast called Darcy and Everest, who are based really close to me. And uh, they had one in stock. So hopefully mm. I might actually nice. be able to, to order this. Mm. But my first one was Malkia Petraea, mm. which I think you aptly described as the heartthrob of gardeners. Who would like to describe <laughs> this plant? Kenton, you want to do that one? Good. I don't know. We, we, this is a plant we both love and grow. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a gorage, so it's related to comfrey and these things. But it, um, it really behaves like a Daphne or maybe even like a lavender, if that's fair. And it's Mediterranean from the Balkans. So it's a little sub shrub thing. Not quite evergreen, is it? Um, you know, it's kind um, of... Yeah, it's a, it's a, is it slightly woody? It's slightly woody, isn't it? It is woody. Oh, it's um, woody. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But, you know, it's, yeah, it's a little gray thing. And then it blooms. And it blooms for a long time because it's a borage. And, they, you know, they do that thing that, like... The scorpion tail unfurls and it just keeps cranking up flowers and it's blue like it's yeah, really like blue it. and just to show off how blue it is the the buds are kind of pink is it the bud paul or is it the old flower one of the one of the ages of flower <laughs> is a slightly different color just to point out yeah. how blue the actual flower is <laughs> it's so good and that one's a little tricky to get a hold of 
and get seed mm-hmm. a little slow to grow from seed. I think you were growing it from cuttings, were you? I, I grow I grow from cuttings. Yeah, yeah. Winter time yeah, nice. with bottom with bottom heat. Yeah, but it's a great plant. It makes a, it it grows into a dome shaped plant, which is perfect uh, for for our our applications. Um, and again, when it's and when it's when it's blooming, it's just covered in flowers. You know, you hardly see even the the gray foliage. It's just a big blue, gorgeous borage thing. It's just a gorgeous thing. So that's uh. Is that one you're? Is that one you're looking for, Thordis? I, that that was when I went through the book, and there were lots of things. But I I love blue, and I now you said it's that kind of borage relative. I'm I'm a sucker for anything like that as well. So I can see why I was drawn no. to it. I also love ferns though, and I did think the Asplenium ceterac. Oh yeah. The um the rusty back fern, the little dinky. Mm-hmm. Um, resurrection fern, I think you described it as. Uh, That's right. Yeah. That was yeah. so cute. And Aren't attractive. they cute? <laughs> I know. And, that, and that's a European fern, as far as I can tell. Um, and it's one that I have never seen in a garden in North America. And then when we went to Europe, it was in almost every garden, <laughs> right? <laughs> At least in the Czech Republic and, I'm, and in the UK, where I saw it in the UK. So it's, it's one that I actually have yet to get my hands on. And I assume we both have yet to get our hands on it. Um, but it's a beautiful little one. It's recently been changed to a splenium. It was called Ceterac officinorum uh, up until recently. Uh, but now it's a spleen wart. So just to <laughs> set the record straight on that one. Um, it's, a, it's a great little fern, though. And it's one that I would say that I experienced FOMO from. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I'm in good mm-hmm. company. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, shall we go straight to your FOMO, Paul? What are you? I mean, apart from that asplenium, which you're welcome to yeah. share. <laughs> I wish I could show you a picture of my Flomo plants because obviously being Flomo, they're ex- exceptionally gorgeous. Um, but my first one, and it's not Flomo because I can't grow it. I'm pretty sure I could. It's just that I have not succeeded in growing it yet, would be Helichrysum milfordii. Um, the Helichrysums, oh. of course, are the straw flowers, right? And when we think of straw flowers, we think of these dried flower arrangement, tall paper things that, you know, they, they come out blue and pink and red and they never change. Um, this one's quite different. It's a it's a bun forming, of course, uh, rosette forming uh plant just hugs the rocks it's from south africa and then of course it has its little straw flower kind of daisy like it's you know it's in the aster family so um just a tiny little but so gorgeous white flower and then it's red underneath and so when it closes you see the, the buds look red and then it opens in the daytime this is horrible we need a picture this hurts <laughs> I, I know i know it's it's like, really do uh, yeah like on page 60 there's a very good illustration of it <laughs> Okay, yeah, there you yeah. go. Hel- Helichrysum yeah, milfordii. I, yeah. I add pictures to the podcast, so the video viewers oh, are going to be lucky. Good. They so, get to see it. so we're we going to talk to... about ice cream, but they actually get to eat ice cream. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you did a good job of describing it, Paul. That, that, Thank you. Yeah. That sounds absolutely <laughs> yeah. wonderful. I love a helichrysum yeah, in its normal state. So that mm-hmm. one, mm-hmm. Yeah. little helichrysum mm-hmm. bun. Yeah. Yum. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Is is Flomothurtis, is it the plant that you, you don't have that you desire? Well, is it your you know, desiderata very, or, or very is it loose term? So it's it's often something I've not grown, but it can be something like I've grown before and want to grow, something I can't grow because mm. I don't have the right conditions for it. It's um it encompasses a whole range of similar feelings where you just want to plant. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. that's a dangerous thing to ask rock gardeners because when you say <laughs> list one plant you really love and want to grow. They'll have to, you know, whittle it down from a list of fifty. Well, you, you know, can, you can start. Have, like, that's that's what rock gardening. Four, about. five, six. Like we're, we're not stingy <laughs> that, on talking dirty. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, it, I I've realized lately I'm in sort of an era of my gardening where I'm really embracing just easy plants to grow because as a rock gardener, I spent almost a good decade trying the most difficult stuff and <laughs> finally managing to grow like Dionysias outside and these like really difficult things. And then some of them just don't live that long if you do manage to keep them alive. And it's even more frustrating when you, you grow it and you bloom it, but you don't get seeds. And then you, you, you're like, oh, man, I'm a dead end to this plant. And there's all this guilt and stuff. So I've been in the last couple of years, I think I've really been in trying to find like easy plants, just like satisfying easy plants. So um, I know sometimes soon I will dive back into the Dionysias and the wacky, tricky stuff. Ferns are really hard, you know, for us, like rock ferns, but or lip ferns. But I think just simple things I just like drool about. I know this is really common in rock gardens, but bolax or isarella, like a good old, or the, the what's the Spanish name, yareta, just a good old 
plastic plant, you know, those really mossy, plasticky, green, lime green. Maybe it's because I live in the desert, you know, and I'm always like wanting what I don't have. But just a good old bolax would be nice. I have one dinky plant that like ekes through the summer here. <laughs> I would sure love to have more of it, you know, and, and the same with like Selenia Collis. We can go hiking here and get up way above tree line and go hit our, our mountain peaks. And it's all over the mountain peaks, but down um, in the hot desert valley where I live, I can't grow it. So I just I just drool about it and um, <laughs> don't do much more about it. I think know? we should redefine Flomo as the plant you drool over. Yeah, ah, there you go. <laughs> drool worthy plant. Which, which yeah. means it's not a plant you have. You're, you can just easily mm -hmm. satisfy that, that <laughs> desire for. Yeah. Yeah. Alan, where are you at with your Flomo this week? <clears throat> My head is spinning. <laughs> but I, I, I mean, the Echinocereus, um, I uh, can't say it, Trigeo. <laughs> tri tri Triglocidiatus. It took a decade for me to learn. Triglocidiatus. Yes. You know, you know what's great about that? Then they changed the name. You know, a new one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting to know that you consider um, those that come from Mexico to be impossibility that we could grow over here. Um, so that's something that I want to in, uh, investigate. Plant de de Delights Nursery, I haven't bought from them, but they send me regular updates, um, and uh, which is very tempting. And I know people that have bought from, from them in England. But the problem mm -hmm. seems to be, as far as everything comes from the USA, tip top, well, wonderfully packed. Everything else is done beautifully until it hits our shores and it gets to our customs houses. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. they kind of sit on it and they don't deal with it. And, um, it, you know, you could end up with a box of silage, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's An not expensive uncommon. expensive box of silage. Yeah. yeah, you know, you know, old Paul Cumbleton really had. I think he had an Akino serious kick. I mean, he's if God made it, Paul probably grew it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but like I know, I think he might be one to ask. Perhaps there's already seed in the UK. Actually, you know, what's his name? Uh, Paul Cumbleton. He was the uh, Alpine curator at Wisley for a very long time. Um, we featured him in the book just because he exemplified you know, crevice gardening, what you can yeah. do. But I wonder, you know, and, and you have some great, um, you know, cactus collectors over there yeah. already on your side of that shore. <laughs> you know, maybe, you know. And great societies as well. I yeah. Think at least, British um, cactus at least one of you, if not both of you, are members of things like the, is it the Scottish Alpine um society mm. there's the alp obviously the alpine society i mean there are great alpine groups for people who want to kind of meet like-minded people and maybe share some plants and seed and stuff mm. i think i think the alpine societies are great for for people who want to have um something slightly unusual because in one of those societies there's bound to be a guy or a girl who's good at propagating something that's probably rare and difficult and all the rest of it and you can you can swap or you know beg borrow or steal steal preferably um, exactly, exactly. It's, it's it's hard to be an island when you're a rock gardener um you really need that community um for those very reasons um yeah. for for mentoring for sharing for learning um you know this is why when zoom happened the meetings weren't as exciting because we couldn't get together and bring our plants and show our plants and share our plants right but yeah, community is very important in rock gardening because there's just not as many of us no. out there, <laughs> right? No, exactly. And we should mention yeah. that all the Alpine Garden Societies would maybe safely say all the national ones have seed exchanges, you know, and many of them have several, like two, 3,000 taxa on their list and they publish a list every year. It's, and that's all people's seeds they pulled out of their gardens, which is amazing. We're getting to that season now. I think we're, Paul and I are gonna be pulling rock garden seed out and sending it to NARGS or SRGC or AGS. And those are essential sources. Yeah. I mean, man, you get to talk about dizzy, you know, reading through just that list, like 3,000 plants. That's, that's that's more than one night. Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> reading material, just skimming through there. Yeah. Surely. At least it's um, yeah. at least it's easier now with the Internet. You can just Google the plant. But I remember 20 years ago with the seed exchanges, you'd be sitting there with a stack of books this high next yeah. to you, <laughs> looking at all these Latin names you've never seen before and looking up every single yeah. one. And it's a great learning experience, that's for sure. It's just yeah. the internet's made it a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, it sure has. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, what with the mountaineering and the propagating and the extremely mm -hmm. long seed list to go through, you really don't have any mm -hmm. spare time. Not really. <laughs> I mean, stay, stay busy in winter. One yeah, good thing yeah. on your side, I think, is that there seems to be a resurgence in 
not crevice gardening, rock gardening in England. Um, and there's, I mean, there's three good gardens that have good rock gardens. One is the RHS Rosemore in Devon. Um, they have this wonderful sort of rocky landscape with water coming through it all the time. And, you know, ferns that I grow here are three foot tall. Down in Devon, they're six feet tall. Is um, that right? <laughs> yeah, it is that, yeah. that different. Um, Chatsworth House in Derbyshire, which is really not house, it's a palace. Um, right. <laughs> they, are, they are in the process of restoring their garden, as is Arley Hall in um, Yorkshire. And Excellent. This is because rock gardens lost popularity but it's coming back that's right i agree yeah yeah i agree with yeah. smaller gardens you know they can grow more plants in a smaller space and mm -hmm. it them. exactly there's lots yeah. of reasons to get back into rock gardening in this modern day right space Not is just one of them yeah. Yeah. climate change um yeah. Uh, another one is time. People have less time these days, um, you know, just trying to just trying to survive. And so rock gardening, you know, especially once the garden's built, uh, tends to be a lot less labor intensive to kind of keep it up. Or you can turn your back on it for longer if you need to and go on holiday and stuff like that. Right. So, yeah, um, I we're hoping that uh, the book in some way will help to spot to, to spur on that resurgence. Uh, just because crevice gardening seems to be a catchword these days amongst rock gardening circles and like everybody knows about crevice gardens so it's the kind of like the popular new thing to do <laughs> yeah it sure is changing i definitely don't think it's going to be exactly the way it used to be you know no because well, there's been a lot of discussion ago, about used this, to be a few know? chunks of broken paving stones which they call crazy <laughs> paving and uh -huh. you know, yeah. how you how you started off you know so yeah i think it's um it's it's gone from a jumble of broken stones to art. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, very much yeah, so. It's, it's, uh, years. I love to overuse the word. It's gone postmodern. It's gone all these different directions. We even there's a picture in the book, but probably one of the most wacky, innovative things we learned about was a styrofoam crevice garden because it's on a roof and it wasn't to mm -hmm. grow alpine plants as much as um, tall grass prairie plants which you usually couldn't grow in a roof garden, right? That's, you know, that was a problem before, but making a styrofoam crevice, like who, who would have thought? How do they thought? fix styrofoam? Wouldn't it blow off? Um, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pinned together, it's locked together. And my guess is it's UV stabilized so that the sun doesn't break it down. But it's yeah. a Peter Korn thing um, over there in Sweden. But Peter you know, Korn of the sand gardens. This, yeah, the sand guy. So. You know, it's like, I, I think this is only the beginning of what we've seen. Like broken concrete might have been like the old nasty thing, but we've now seen some beautiful things done with broken concrete because they don't have rock in some places on earth, to be fair. You know, and, and then there's also that ecological side of it and the, the climate change side is, you know, what do we do with these big heaps of concrete, which, um, you know, the statistics on, on the um, carbon emissions for making concrete is like staggering. So, you know, turning that junk into uh, a garden is wonderful. Yeah. You know, there's, it's truly gone postmodern. I love just watching that right now. It's, it's crazy. It's nuts. It's not not your grandma's rock it, garden anymore. I mean, talk, talk <laughs> about, talking about materials, um, for instance, I mean, I'm seeing people doing something similar with logs. They're mm -hmm. using wooden nice. logs. I mean, the whole thing nice. gradually just degenerates because, you know, it, it yep. rocks, um, invertebrates and goodness knows what, eat it, use it, live on it, fungi live on it. And it's, it's just another way of using kind of crevice gardening i guess That's great yeah yeah mm -hmm. there's, there's plants that specialize on that a lot of those ferns we're talking about specialize yeah, on rotting ferns, logs ferns, ferns. or I've pleonies been... like yeah and just inside just inside the entrance to my garden there's a pile of logs and we deliberately left the logs and they have over time sort of become this crumbly dark brown stuff with ferns in them that, i mean the, the spores of ferns have just come in i didn't put them in there but you wow. know it's it just something that happens Paul, well, that might be a challenge we should put forward is someone build the first wooden crevice garden. <laughs> no kidding. Do it. I dare you. Never say never. Yeah. That's, that's, that's when it'll Benton happen. It's been done. You know? We did it first. Oh, you did it first. Oh, never mind. Go, go never write a mind. book about it. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, what yeah. I love is this is a really exciting time. People are, I'm sure, going to want to try this. And you've got a book with 250 plants to inspire them. Um, so <laughs> thank you. For, I mean, it must have been a lot of work putting this together. So thank you very much for the hours that you clearly spent. Mm researching it and all these beautiful photographs and all this really useful info we are indebted to you for your labors it's our pleasure <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't mean anything if it didn't get read so <laughs> thank you so much 
Well, mm -hmm. go, go out and read it. The crevice garden, <laughs> how to make the perfect home for plants from rocky places. And no, just remember, came... everybody, just remember, everybody, Christmas is not that far away. It's a great present. <laughs> <laughs> And know that the people behind it have their own fabulous crevice garden, so they definitely know <laughs> what they're talking about. You saw it here on Talking Dirty. <laughs> Guys, I'm so glad we managed to make this work. It wasn't the easiest thing to set up because four people who were busy <laughs> in different time zones was not, yeah. not easy, but it was so <laughs> well worthwhile. <done. laughs> so, yeah, pleasure. So thank nice you, to everybody. Meet you both. <laughs> Happy gardening, everybody. Okay. Happy gardening. Yeah. Happy gardening. Happy gardening. Happy gardening. Happy gardening. All the best. <laughs> Getting ready to go for a drive? Here we go. Well, let's see. The <laughs> Wi-Fi router can't say American Wi-Fi is going to be any better than Canadian. So, oh yeah, you want to see. Whoop. I see clouds in the sky there, Kenton. You don't get clouds I, there, do you? Oh, is that what they're called? I forgot. Uh, yeah. We haven't seen them in such a long time. It's been, actually been raining here on and off the last week, which has been amazing. You got to be kidding me. It was a dry, me. hot year. No Dry kidding. Yeah. We're happy. The plants yeah. are happy. This is going to be good. so much fun. <laughs> and if people... sharp drainage. Sorry, sorry, you go. No, no, you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you're gonna, you're gonna need to enable my screen sharing. It says, it says host has disabled screen sharing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's so... see. Can I? Multiple mm -hmm. participants can share simultaneously. Let's see, is that enabled it? Ooh. There you go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I'll see if I can mm -hmm. uh, make it big. Is this here. your flow mo plant, Paul? Oops, what have I done here? <laughs> <laughs>